Hello, and welcome to Gemini Network Open Live. I'm Seth Truger, Digital Media Editor at Gemini Network Open. Of course, if you're following along live, please send us your questions on Twitter at Gemini Network Open or on Facebook or YouTube in the comment box under the video. Today, we are talking about patient and visit characteristics associated with the use of direct scheduling in primary care practices. And we've got first author, Dr. Ashani Ganguly with us. Welcome, Dr. Ganguly. Thanks so much for having me, Seth. Great. Well, really appreciate that you could join us. This is a really interesting paper on uh, what's becoming a more and more timely topic. Um, so first, if you could just give us a little introduction about uh, who you are, what you do, and why you do the paper. Thanks so much. So I'm an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and an internist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, both in Boston. Um, and I'm interested in the value of, of ambulatory care. And, and um, this particular paper is looking at direct scheduling. So that means patients logging into their online portal to schedule their own visits directly. This is a self-service option that is offered in most other industries, right? Uh, we all, we've all experienced it, so, but it's relatively new in healthcare and hasn't really been studied. So when our health system began rolling out direct scheduling, we saw this opportunity to understand both its potential benefits and its unintended consequences. Yeah, and I found it really interesting. I think, you know, as you said, this is the kind of thing where uh, most other industries are doing something like this, getting restaurant reservations, uh, right. you know, scheduling a haircut. Uh, you know, I don't want to make a phone call and talk to people. I want to go online with a website and click on a button. Totally. Um, so tell us what you did here. Yeah, so we started by surveying practice leaders about what they thought, um, their hopes, their concerns about direct scheduling. We worked really closely with the operational folks um, at the, at the um, medical center to understand what they were doing behind the scenes. And then we used electronic health record data to study who adopted these visits and how they were used. And so I'll give you some sort of big picture uh, takeaways or, or um, findings, and then we can uh, delve into anything that you find you want to chat about more. So we looked at 62,000 patients across 17 primary care practices, and 8% of them used direct scheduling at least once during the year we studied. Um, this was 2018 uh, 18 through 19. And most patients scheduled one or two visits uh, through direct scheduling over that study year. And then I can get into more as we as we chat. Sure. I mean, yeah, some of the things I found, so it was about 8% of the visits that you found of the 134,000 were directly scheduled. Um, I found some really interesting variation here. So, so not surprisingly, patients were younger, uh, more likely to be white and commercially insured. Yeah. Uh, fewer prior visits and hospitalizations. I think, you know, generally a younger, healthy population. Um, but then there were some surprises, like uh, people with mo more comorbidities and lower income. Mm -hmm. So what did you think about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we looked at these um, analyses, sort of these individual characteristics one by one, and then when we put them all together in a model, only some of them came out as, as sort of being significant. And um, I'll note that we also, um, we use practice fixed effects. In other words, we compared patients within the same practices because you can imagine that different practices have very different styles or approaches to adopting or, or offering the service. And so when we do all of that, it turns out that being younger, being white, um, having more, more comorbidities, um, and being commercially insured were the factors that really mattered. Um, and so the comorbidity one is interesting. I think um, you know it mirrors other findings in um, literature on having patient portal access. And it might just mean that you know if you have more chronic conditions, you are you know you have some reason to to want to to get into that patient portal to check your results to talk to your doctor. So that's sort of a good news to me. A, you know a, a a logical and maybe a, you know some good news there. Um, the younger, you know, uh, younger folks using it more is not surprising, but also, you know, of course, um, it introduces some concerns as well. Right. And I, um, yeah, I, mean, I think one of the concerns, and you talk about this in the paper a bit, is, uh, you know, potentially exacerbating disparities, things like the digital divide or are, are patients with better resources, more tech savvy, uh, going to be able to kind of, I don't know, take up appointments, especially when they're limited. Yeah, it's a great point. And so right now, as you saw, the uptake is pretty low, right? These are early adopters. And so, um, but because we expect this to grow broadly, right? So EHR, EHRs like Epic and Cerner, the big ones across the country, all offer this and um, health systems just need to turn it on. Um, and so as it's becoming more uh, commonplace, there is this risk of um, these, these visits scheduled directly or you know, displacing visits for maybe older patients or patients who are um, sicker or have um, have historically um, not been as as linked or served by primary care or the health systems. Mm -hmm. and one of the things I found interesting. Oh, sorry, I'm going to welcome Ravi Oberoi has joined us. Welcome. We're talking about direct scheduling and primary care. Um, one of the things that was interesting how how many more of these visits or most of these visits were more likely to be things like just general medical exams um, mm -hmm. and actually had long wait times. Um, yeah. 
Do you think that's just people planning ahead or just the nature of what, what appointments were offered? Uh, great question. So it really was, a lot of it was a feature of the design, so, so the latter. Um, and so the um, you had to schedule a visit. So the, the, understandably, they didn't want same-day visits where, um, you know, if you're calling for chest pain or something more urgent, you would want to have some, um, you know, conversation with a human being to, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of it was a feature of that. Um, and you could only schedule general med medical visits, um, follow-ups, or chronic condition visits. So um, that was part of the reason. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah and, and I'm totally speculating based on the info you have and, and can't confirm any of this, but it seems plausible to me that people with more comorbidities might just you know, recognize, oh, I'm going to run out of medications in three months or six months. I need to right. plan ahead my visit. Uh, you know, I don't see a doctor much. I don't have a lot of comorbidities. I don't need to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. Know. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. Um, <laughs> right. We could do some more digging to to learn that, but <laughs> right. um, I'll uh, also add. Sorry, go ahead. Please, no, please. I was going to say along those lines of of you know functions of the design. The other thing that we found to be really promising, and this may be where you were going, was the issue of continuity. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is continuity is one of those four core functions of primary care. And we found that directly scheduled visits were much more likely to be with your own primary care doctor. So 95% of those visits versus 74% of visits where you just call to schedule. Um, and that's even true for patients who themselves scheduled both ways. Um, and this is a large part because the, um, the way the system works, you have to schedule with someone you've seen before, but that doesn't have to be your PCP, right? So it is still meaningful. Um, and it's promising because, you know, we know that continuity is linked to better health outcomes. Um, and it can be a feature that's sort of exploited for, for um, positive benefit. So I'm curious, I'm going to ask you to speculate a bit now, is how much do you think the differences in the patients who are direct scheduling um, is because there's fundamental differences in who does the direct scheduling uh, in patients, or was it just early adopters are different than if, if everything was direct scheduled, that they would, they would yeah. those differences would just uh, disappear? Excuse me. Mm, it's a good question. I mean, so I... It's hard to know. I think, you know, and I, I will also emphasize that the differences aren't that large, right? So we're not seeing, you know, odds ratios of any more than like 1.8, so, so it's, there's subtle, it's, it's not as un inequitable, I guess, as we might worry about. Um, and I think, yeah, some of it is just people who are adopting early. I'd also point out that we're looking at patients who all have access to the, to the patient portal. Yeah. So we're already selecting for people who have some savvy with that. And so that's probably why we see smaller differences. And in, among that group, we're probably going to see, um, hopefully there won't be too many more gaps as, as it's more widely adopted. But, but again, it's hard to say. It's interesting. And then of course, we're going to have to talk about COVID. Um, yeah. So, you know, as, as the world's changing with COVID and access to care, there's a shift towards telemedicine, you know, uh, distance visits. Um, how do you think what you found here is going to apply to how we schedule telemedicine and how, how primary care goes in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, I think that there are trends in all industries towards greater convenience. We just have the technologies there, right? The patient interest is there. It's really been healthcare us, right? Doctors like you and me and, and health systems who have been reluctant to give patients control over doing some of these things. And I think that's changing over time. So, you know, another great example of this is open notes, right? Where we thought, oh my gosh, how could we ever let patients look at their own notes? And now we realize, hey, that's a great idea. And the things we worried about aren't really happening. Um, so similar here, um, and I would say that um, telemedicine is just another facet of that. So there's no reason that um, visits can't be uh, directly scheduled for telemedicine as well. Um, and we haven't done that, at least in our health system, as far as I know, we haven't gone there yet, but not for any particularly good reason. Um, really, it's just been um, you know, a pivot that we need to make. Yes. Um, great. Uh, Heidi uh, Gracciamo has joined us. Welcome. We're uh, finishing up talking about direct scheduling for primary care. Another thing I found really interesting, and you talked about this a bit in the paper again, is that the people who did direct scheduling were more likely to cancel their visits. Mm -hmm. uh, was that, I mean, we, we already talked about how their visits were likely to be out longer anyway. Mm -hmm. Do you think, uh, how do you think that played in there? Yeah, so this is something that, you know, we, we sort of shared data that we got from the operational side and didn't look at ourselves, but um, these visits are more likely to be canceled and rescheduled. And so it's, in essence, patients working the list or working their schedules, which honestly is, uh, you know, we've done this again, like I've, I'm sure you've done this, Seth, right? I do this all the time with like my kids' haircuts or whatever else. Um, it's, you know, it's a nice, it's sort of a, not a bad thing to put on patients who know their schedules, who have the motivation to try to do that rather than um, it going through a third, um, somebody sitting at the front desk who's already overworked in a doctor's office. 
So I think that cancellations really just signify that action happening, um, and that's probably not a bad thing. We also see lower no-show rates. So once you do schedule it, you know, you a you've because you've, you've invested in, in putting that effort to schedule the visit and you're less likely to, um, when you finally decide what visit you're, when you're gonna come in, that you actually show up, which is a good thing. Yeah, and that, that's been really interesting. My wife's a, a dietitian and she's doing all televisits now. Um, and uh, one, not only is her schedule much more full, but there's fewer mm-hmm. cancellations too. And I feel like it's it's the more the more you move friction, the more people do stuff. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and you yeah. noted some of the stats that I'm going to uh, botch because I'm not looking at it right now, but the people who call to schedule spent like six minutes on the phone or transferred 60% of the time. You know, it's, I, I think there's also a bit of an age thing where like, I don't have patience to make a phone call. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I, you know, if somebody's not on Grubhub, I get really annoyed or <laughs> I don't want to talk yeah. to someone. I don't want yeah, to have to totally. be able to. Yeah, exactly. And so, so there's yeah, a previous study that found that people were on hold an average of eight minutes. Um, yeah. And um, so, what we found here to that point, though, which um, which really surprised me, but because uh, I when I went into this, I was thinking, you know, people are going online in the evenings when they're after their kids are asleep to schedule. But more than three quarters of directly scheduled visits were actually scheduled during business hours. So, in other words, patients could have called, but they chose not to. And I think the reason it's very clear, and you you articulated it really nicely, Seth. Um, you know, and I have now been scheduling my visits directly, um, as one example, um, it's, it's just pretty easy and nice, yeah. um, again, for visits that are not urgent, right? That's the, that's the key, but. Right. And I, th- I think, and, and to build on what you said earlier, uh, the health system has been reluctant to change for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, mostly I think, frankly, cause we just haven't had to, and yeah. now that we have to, uh, we're able to make those changes. And it's that little nudge that pushes us forward into doing it. And, you know, hopefully things like telemedicine, direct scheduling, things like that are going to stay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to that point, Seth, right. So there's some work that you and I have both um, worked in this space on trying to understand why primary care visits are declining. And, um, you know, we haven't been sort of up on the technology in many ways. And there are other sites, um, for example, urgent care clinics and retail clinics that have, um, that are not overtaking primary care visits, but are other sites patients are using. And I do think that the convenience factor is a big piece of that. Um, so that to the extent that, you know, traditional primary care offices can adopt some of these just really common sense uh, approaches to try to make uh, accessing mm-hmm. care easier, it's going to go uh, make a big difference. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think I, it was really interesting. I love it when your paper came out because the one I worked on um, was basically practices are seeing fewer primary care visits. And then your paper was patients are doing fewer primary care visits. And I love seeing them from different sides like that. So, and yours was in JAMA IM, correct? Um, we've had a couple, um, uh, but that one, or the one was, I'm, um, well, you've had. A, um, yeah, we've, this is, I've probably spent more of my life doing it than you have to be fair. Um, <laughs> but, um, or I don't know what, what I mean there, but, um, annals, there's one in annals, um, looking at adult population. There was one in annals of family medicine, looking, um, at using the MC's data as well. Um, looking at practices. And then we looked at, um, pediatrics and JAMA pediatrics, Great. a couple different sites. Great. Well, of course, the jam one stand out to me. Uh, but, well, really great talking to you. Uh, this is really interesting work and important stuff. I um, uh, appreciate you uh, publishing it and, and coming on the show. Um, of course, you can get this paper and more at jamanetworkopen.com, where you can read everything for free. We've got new papers coming out every weekday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And join us again next week, September 8th uh, at 3 p.m. Central Time for another episode of JNO Live. So take care. Stay safe. Thanks so much.